I'm going to ask uh, Matt to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Matt is on the City Planning Commission, uh, which sees and hears and makes decisions on most of the major projects in the city and works closely with our speaker this evening. And we've had, over the years, every planning director of the city uh, attend our community meetings. We believe strongly that planning is the key to Sherman Oaks. Shh, Bob, after the meeting. Okay. Uh, the key to making Sherman Oaks desirable, the quality of life uh, that we want, is planning. There is going to be development. The question is, is it going to better our community or create more problems? So this is a really an important uh, matter. But wait a minute, before I, I, we have another deputy here who lives in Sherman Oaks. Who do you work for net today? <laughs> She's had a good question. Okay, uh, Miriam Jaffe, uh, who uh, works for controller uh, Wendy Gruel, who spoke here a month or so ago, and uh, Miriam is uh, a Sherman Oaks resident, member of the association. Thank you. So, Matt, what do you know about our speaker this evening? Um, I've known Michael for uh, for a while. I worked with him when I was on the uh, uh, South Valley Area Planning Commission. I, I had the pleasure of working with Michael on, on uh, some cases. Um, I've got a whole uh, bio on Mike, but I'm not going to I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to let him talk about uh, his accomplishments. Um, we, we, we worked, he, he follows uh, the last planning director, who was Gail Goldberg, who was, it was a pleasure working with her too. Uh, Michael has some big shoes to fill with, with uh, uh, filling her shoes, but he's doing a fantastic job, really a fantastic job. He has a lot of respect, downtown, yeah, and, and all the, uh, uh, the, the, the different planning offices. He's got a lot of respect from, from the rank and file, and he also has a lot, a lot of respect from uh, just regular folk. He's really, he's, he's, uh, he's earned his stripes. He's been with the planning department for 13 years, and he's led all different types of divisions and, and, and has a, a lot of uh, great visions as far as where the city is going. So, come on up, Michael, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll let you talk about your past and uh, your future as far as what, what you see. And uh, it's your show. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everybody. Those are some great problems. So, Matt told me everyone's out here to hear me speak, and I really know you're out here for the food. That was a really good dinner, so thank you for having me. Um, my name is Mike LeGrand. I'm the Director of Planning. I've been in this position since August of this year. And um, one of the interesting things when I got this job, um, the mayor came to me and said, you know, we're going to give you the reins of the department. You know, are you looking forward to this? And I said, yeah, I'm really excited. I've been waiting my whole career to really be able to kind of implement the vision for the city that I think can really carry us through the next century. And it's kind of like when your dad when you turns 16 and gives you a car. He never told me I needed new tires, the transmission was broken, the wheels were falling off, but I'm enjoying driving nonetheless. But um, it's been a really challenging time. We've had some really difficult budget times, but um, we're trying to find ways to do a lot more with less. Um, I have a document in the back that's our blueprint for 2010-2011. It looks like this, so I encourage you to pick one up when you go by. And it has a lot of the information I'll be talking to you briefly about tonight in a little more detail. And really what it does, is it sets kind of a compass and a course for the department. How can we be more transparent? How can we work with people? How can we be a tool for the community to feel like they have a voice within the department? One of the things that's really alarming to me in the planning department, having worked here 13 years, is I go out to groups like you. I go out to different parts of the city and people don't understand the process. Um, they see a project like the Routes Evolve, who worked on very hard to make a better project. And they see that and they say, how do we engage? We feel like City Hall doesn't listen to us. What are the areas that we can actually influence this project? How can we have our voices heard? Um, we're the ambassadors of you. We're the people that protect you from development that's too large for your community. We're also the people that can explain the laws and the rules and the regulations to make sure that environmental laws are being passed, that those laws are being upheld, that development's happening in a sensible way. But we also are the stewards of good land use. So when you have a general plan that's really the constitution for the city, we're the department that's in charge of updating that it's a really crucial time right now as we're facing these budget challenges, the city's looking for ways to save revenue, that there's certain core functions that aren't cut from the department. Um, last week, the chief administrative officer for the city um, wanted to reduce our department by $1 million for the remainder of the fiscal year. 
would have laid off 20 employees and completely stopped our advanced planning program. So all the community plan updates that we're working on, one up the street in Granada Hills, for example, um, we're working on, and we have to basically put those plans that we've invested two years to a halt so that the city can fix a short-term budget gap that there's uh, many other ways to address rather than taking these precious dollars um, that are very few that go to the planning department. So we fought against that and educated the city council members, and luckily, they agreed with us that planning was important to the community. And many people, some of which in this room I've seen tonight, um, came up to the city council and testified how important planning was for the community to have a vision so that people aren't forced to engage with the city project by project. But there's really a community plan that represents the areas in your neighborhood and what you want to preserve in your neighborhood and what you want to see grow. And the areas where there's too much traffic that we should avoid certain roads. We shouldn't have traffic flows through certain neighborhoods. How do we protect our historic resources? All those types of discussions have a document that really puts those to life and requires the decision makers to follow something like that. So you're not having these battles project by project, but rather the dialogue on a larger scale for what is the vision of those people in the community? What do the voters feel should take place in the community? And how can we have a document that reflects that? So luckily the city council agreed and they basically um, amended the CEO's report to not take that million dollars from planning. So we're still able to go forward with our advanced planning program and update many of our outdated community plans that we've been working on with a lot of people in this room for many years. A little good news I heard from your land use chair earlier uh, about the baseline nationalization. Um, just this week we got the draft back from the city attorney's office after five months. So the nationalization issue is back in our hands. We took their corrections, which um, were pretty much editorial, um, not very substantive, but regardless, we got them after five months. We took those corrections, we forwarded it back to the city attorney, now we go into the city council. And after the city council adoption, which should take place next month, we hope, um, it'll become law after 30 days. So we're about 60 days away from that actually becoming law. So pretty much anyone who's in the process now wouldn't be very smart if they didn't follow those new rules that'll be in place. By the time they go through the building permit process, um, they're gonna need to comply with those. So all the work that many people in this room did, we're starting to see the fruits of your labor. So we really appreciate that. One of the things we're trying to do in the planning department is really organize ourselves geographically. As many of you know, we have a robust office in our um, Browdy building that um, contains many of our planners who work within your community. But making sure that you have planners that are familiar with the issues in your neighborhood. We've also, for the first time ever in the department, created a position called the Community Liaison. The Community Liaison will be a person that will have, her name is Claudia Rodriguez, she'll be available to come to meetings like this and discuss with you the issues that you feel you want to have go directly to me in the planning department. If there's issues with your neighborhood association, the neighborhood council, or as an individual that you feel, maybe you're doing a kitchen addition and you're not sure what the side yard requirements are and how do you navigate that. Um, maybe you're selling your home and some zoning code issues come up and you want to know how to address those, we'll be there to help you. Or maybe there's a big project of condominiums coming in your, down your street and you want to know what's the process to be able to get your voice to be heard. That person will be your voice to City Hall and make sure you get in touch with the right people in the right place and they get back to you in a responsive manner. We've been spending a lot of time working on how do we change our process. With the mayor's office, we've been going through what we call uh, process reform. And we're looking at how we can make our processes easier to understand, more transparent, and more user friendly. So from anyone who wants to pull a building permit to somebody who wants to do a mega development, how do we make sure we ask the right questions and at the end of the day that we're doing the right analysis and we're really providing that service to the city of analyzing those projects against the rules and regulations that are in place to help steer our decision makers. And so we've been spending a lot of time trying to kind of get back to the nuts and bolts of planning, learning to do more with less, and like everyone's household and most people that run businesses, try and find ways to see how we can create more efficiency with the department, provide services with less staff, but still remain to provide our core services, which we feel is good land use planning, good stewards of the built environment, making sure that things like walkability, wider sidewalks, that traffic flows safely, um, that we don't overbuild in our neighborhoods, and that we protect our single family homes. Um, we have many historic preservation overlay zones that are very active in the city. Um, we've expanded that group, and we keep going through and doing a survey of all the inventory of historic homes throughout the city, and identifying those and putting protections in place to help preserve those homes so that our grandchildren can see all the different types of architecture that have come and gone through Los Angeles, and we can preserve the core of those. Some of the other things that we're doing in the department 
is really trying to separate um, our case processing from our advanced planning. Most planning departments now are dependent upon application fees to provide services. With the city budget and the deficit we're facing next year, we've heard numbers up to $300 million in the deficit next year that we'll be facing. We have to find ways to be creative. But what my fear is, what I don't want to happen is the department becomes the department of case processing. So all we're doing is being supported by fees from development projects. So that's why it's really important I want to talk to you tonight just a little briefly about the, really the need to make sure that we keep our plans up to date that you're engaging with us on broader visions for your community, the areas where we want to see transit, the areas where we feel that we have a need for more parking, where we think there's not enough parking, where should we have our senior housing, where should we have our multifamily housing, um, how those measure are, the new rail investment fit within our neighborhoods, where does high-speed rail go, where should those stations go, all those types of discussions we want to have and make sure that we prepare for the next 20 years in the city, as well as the next six months in the city of Los Angeles. And it's really important that our planning department has that core service that's funded through tax dollars and doesn't just become the department that's funded through application fees where it's a pay-to-play system. So one of my jobs is a lot of communication with our decision makers in the city council. And luckily we have a very robust city council. Our planning and land use committee um, is headed up by Ed Reyes, but also Councilman Kukorian is on that committee and Councilman Weezar. And they all have a keen sense of planning and protecting the neighborhoods that many of you live in. So I know your representative here, working with him on the Plum Committee, has been very helpful to make sure that the Valley's issues are heard loud and clear. And so we look forward to having a continued dialogue with you, having our staff engage you, whether it's the questions you have about a particular project or about you wanting to create a more pedestrian-friendly shopping and retail environment in your neighborhood. We're here to help you and work for you. So I'm available for any questions, unless Matt has a question, kind of scared of his questions. <laughs> Okay, actually, because Matt's on the Planning Commission, he's not going to ask the question. No. John Eisen is coming. But you and John are going to have to learn how to share, because we only have one microphone this evening. So, so John, you have the questions. I do. Uh, thank you for all the questions. A number of them are not for the planning department, so I'm not going to ask them. But I'll ask as many as I can. So these are from the audience, and if you want to stand up when I ask your question, do so, or you can remain anonymous. So the first question is from Elke Heidmeier. And Elke asks, how do you plan to balance the huge increases in housing units proposed by developers with an infrastructure that is already at the brink of collapse? Traffic, sewer, fresh water in particular. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we do is when we look at planning for your community, we make sure we take infrastructure, fire stations, library, parkland, all into place. And those projects have to mitigate those issues to a level of less than significance. It's kind of an artful dance that these projects go through to do that analysis. One of the things that we try and do is provide the best possible information to the decision makers so that they understand that this project that's coming before you may have an impact on two or three intersections within your community. In order to approve this project, there's a very high standard you have to go through under law to show that it's still viable to put that project forward. Make sure that we give the decision makers the best information possible in a transparent fashion so people can understand there's a cost to some of these projects and sometimes there's a benefit to some of them. And in other cases, they flat out don't fit within the context of that zone or that community. And one of the things, if you look at my track record in the planning department, is I haven't been afraid to say no. As my prior job as Chief Zone Administrator, I said no to many, many projects, many, many applications. And the ones that made sense to me and followed our rules and regulations and our plans, we could say yes to and defend those projects. But when there's time to say no, you have to be willing to say no and make sure the decision makers hear you loud and clearly. Jay Weitzler asks, if your office feels community plans are valuable, why does